Good morning. It's the spring. She's teasing us. So I'd like to speak this morning about receptivity and the wisdom of receptivity. Um, you know, when we think about a life that is um, informed by, lived through a spiritual practice or spiritual um, endeavoring, uh, our attempt to uh, live a life that is harmonized with, that is uh, in concert with, that is caring for and being cared for by um, something that is beyond our narrow conception of the practicalities of life, you know, just kind of getting through. Um, uh, oftentimes we overlook uh, that there is something that needs to be cultivated, a kind of a body uh, that is not our normal body. And when I say body here, I don't mean just our physical body, but I mean our mental body, uh, all the ways that we hold ourselves together as a thing is what I'm calling a body. That there is a very special body, we could refer to it as a spiritual body, which is uh, unbelievably alive. And in fact, it's what animates our normal way of thinking of who we are. But it is our bad habit to cling to who we think we are, to the surfaces of things. And there's this really um, uh, regrettable deadening effect. You can feel this in your life. You, know? you say you get a job you, you know, and you're excited about it. Like, oh, this great new job I have, or this thing I'm going to do, this, this, this new course I'm going to be involved in in study, or you know, whatever it is. And you enter with this very alive mind. You're very animated by what the potentials and what your, um, what your inspiration is. And then as you carry out the work or you carry out the study, it's very, very natural for there to be a kind of calcification and a frustration. And some of that is just simply struggle. Like, you didn't know what you're getting into. Anything really worth doing, you won't know what it is you're getting into. Right? You think you do. You have to think you do. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. Right? But then once you really get involved, then you see like, oh, okay, I didn't know. Right? And then something really beautiful can happen. But also, there can be a kind of clinging to this, um, this idea of who I am or idea of the way of seeing things. And a calcification starts to, uh, starts to appear. So this body that's underneath, is cultivated through receptivity. Receptivity is like when we step back and we become a receptacle for receiving, as opposed to pushing forward to figure out, to understand or to accomplish or to see clearly, we might call it, although we've been talking about seeing clearly in a little bit different way. It's a kind of uh, stepping forward and accumulating or finding your way on the path. Now that's very impor important for us to step forward. But when the stepping forward isn't balanced with the receptivity, then uh, we get uh, tripped up and the path becomes kind of hard, I mean rigid. And then it takes its toll and the kind of aliveness of spring that we feel when we see the buds on the trees, when we see this green stuff pushing up through the earth, um, uh, we lose a connection with it. In Buddhism, um, particularly as it came through China, this term, the way, the Tao, uh, became very important. All through East Asian um, uh, spiritual traditions, you see this word, uh, everywhere, uh, Tao. Right? 
Right? Tao Te Ching, probably many of you have read the Tao Te Ching or heard of the Tao Te Ching, that Tao. It's all, in Japanese, it's called Do. So if any of you practice martial arts, there's a Do on the end. You know, Aiki Do, Ju Do. If you, if you practice T, Cha Do. Okay. All of these Do's are all referred to as a way, as a path. So on that path, we have to walk forward. But think about the path is not just about the trail. The path is also about the forest. If we only focus on the trail, if we only focus on where's my foot go next because there's this clear trail, then we lose the whole meaning of the path. We're just focused on what it is that I have to do, what is it that I have to do next, what is it that I have to do next, how can I understand what this trail is, when the trail only has any meaning because of the forest that it's in. If we're here in the Willamette Valley, probably we say forest, you know. If you're in Eastern Oregon, maybe you say through the dusty hills or the sagebrush or whatever it is, right? The whole environment, the wholeness of our life is the significance of that trail. So to navigate the way, it's not only that we need to learn to walk skillfully or to do the different things of the tradition or the different practices, but we have to become receptive in this very profound way in which a stepping on the path is an actualization of the forest. Actualization is kind of a fancy word here, but I'm saying that that one step on the path in the forest is uh, the forest is the significance of the forest, is the significance of the self, is the significance of, uh, of the walking. So this is the spiritual body that we cultivate. The body that is not such hard division between uh, the self and other things, that is uh, receiving and giving uh, all of the time. In one of the core texts of the Mahayana tradition, the Diamond Sutra, uh, there's this very famous um, lines. Actually, it's some of the lines that are written on that post out there, which is known as a kaktoba. That was put up at the mountain seat ceremonies last year. And my, my good friend and colleague, um, Shumio Kojima, um, uh, he's the abbot of uh, Zen Shuji in, um, in Los Angeles. It was the first Soto Zen temple in North America. Um, he's lived there for many years and became the abbot several years ago. And uh, so he, he wrote this, uh, this uh, kaktoba here. And he asked me what I wanted to write on it. And this is what I wanted him to write on it. So he did. The Buddha asked Sabudi, what do you think? Is the space to the east easy to measure? Sabuti replied, no, it isn't Buddha. The Buddha said, likewise, is the space to the south, to the west, to the north, in between, above, below, or in any of the ten directions, easy to measure? So Buddha replied, no, it isn't Buddha. The Buddha said, in the same way, Sabuddhi, the body of merit of those bodhisattvas who give a gift without being attached isn't easy to measure. The Buddha's teaching Sabuddhi how to practice. And he's giving this instruction about the practice of generosity. He says, if you can give a gift, if you can give a gift to another being without being attached, without being like, oh, I'm giving you this gift. I'm giving you this gift, right? Mm -hmm. But to simply give a gift, a physical gift, an emotional gift, a spiritual gift, a gift of attention, any kind of attention, any kind of gift. So if you can give this gift without uh, attachment, there is a body of merit, there is a spiritual body, there is a truth of our being which can be alive there, and it is not easy to measure. In the Chinese, it probably says a little more like, it's not possible to measure it. It's immeasurable, it's ungraspable. There's this body that is us our heart, our mind, our physical body, our relationships, our communities, which is ungraspable and alive. 
How will you know that, Subhuti? The Buddha says, by a gift. Now actually, in this translation, which is one of my favorite translations of the Diamond Sutra, it gets caught up a little bit in the English. English is a little, you know, it's a wonderful language, has a lot of strengths, and it has some weaknesses. And one of the weaknesses is, it's too darn specific. And so when you translate this, you have to translate something about this gift and the way that Red Pine translated in this translation is to give a gift. But in the Chinese, actually, it just says to, to practice, it doesn't even say to practice, just to generosify, <laughs> right? Generosify. And it's not clear whether generosification is something that uh, uh, moves from you to others or from others to you, right? It's actually the same. The word in Chinese or the Japanese uh, pronunciation of Chinese is huse. When you say o huse, Usually people colloquially would think that means like an offering that you bring to a temple. But if you think about that, the person who's bringing the offering is giving something, but the receiving of the offering is equally ofuse. It's equally generosifying, all right? So you can see where I'm going here, that we don't practice this generosity. We don't, we don't practice the aliveness of the spiritual body simply by giving without attachment, but there also is receiving. And the receiving, as it turns out, is equally important to the giving. We won't know how to give if we don't also receive. And we won't know how to receive if we don't give. It's not like a, like a, a valve that only lets things go in one direction. It's like a doorway that's open and things are flowing uh, back, uh, back and forth. There's an ancient story or legend about uh, one of the first Zen, women Zen masters in Japan, actually one of the first Zen masters in Japan. Um, she was contemporary, uh, is that what you call it, at the same time as um, Dogen Zenji, the founder of uh, this particular school of uh, Zen Buddhism in, uh, in Japan. Um, she lived around the same time as him. And uh, she's oftentimes referred to as Chiono, which was her um, pre-ordination name. And she practiced Zen with a very famous uh, teacher, Mugaku uh, Sogen, who uh, was Chinese and moved to Japan uh, to teach in about the same era that Dogen was. This is in the um, early 13th century. And um, there's this famous uh, story about her um, in the study with, uh, with him, and it has to do with the bucket. And so oftentimes you'll see this story referred to as Chiono's bucket. Um, now, most people know uh, well, people who know the story, mostly they know the latter part of the story, which I'm going to get into later, but I won't spoil that part yet. And it has to do with the, the, the bucket falling apart. But there's a beginning to that that oftentimes we don't hear. And that is when Chiono was studying uh, with her uh, teacher Mugaku, one day she composed a poem and she brought it to him. And the poem went like this. The bucket held the stream the reflection of the moon through pines dwells there in purity. The bucket held the stream. The reflection of the moon through pines dwells there in purity. So you can get the image of this. Moonlight. There's a lot of awakening that happens in moonlight. And she has this bucket. It's probably a lacquered bucket. She was an aristocrat. That would be the kind of bucket they'd probably have. Probably black lacquer, held together with um, some bamboo strips around the edges. Uh, probably has a handle. And um, the legend tells us that she had gone to fetch water to uh, use for the flower arrangements. And there's this moment, the moon there in the bucket. What kind of receptivity does it take even to just notice that, first of all? And then to really receive it, not just the moon received in the bucket, but the heart 
of this sincere person of the way to receive that moon into the water of their own being, the heart of their own being. Sometimes we talk about Zazen as being like sitting with a big bowl of muddy water. Kilgen Carlson Doshi, the founder, the co-founder of Dharma Rain Zen Center, he used to use this image a lot, and that's where I first heard it. I loved it. When you're sitting, I like it. He would go like this too when he did. He was like, you're sitting with a bowl of water that's muddy. <laughs> he would go like this, which is the feeling of Zazen, right? right? I am a bowl of water. I'm a big, you know, whatever you like, you know. I kind of, sometimes I feel like maybe I'm kind of a lumpy clay um, kind of big pot, you know. Um, I rarely feel like a very kind of finely crafted metal bowl, but maybe you feel like that. Um, whatever it is, you know, you're like this. And this water that is our whole being, we're sitting here. And it's so hard to see clearly, you know. It's just filled with all the swirling of mud, wonderful mud, actually, wonderful mud. And so we sit and there's no way to make that water clear. Anything you do to try to make the water clear only stirs up the mud. So you sit with this kind of reliance on this big bowl of muddy water. And the wholeness of it, the directness of it, the intimacy of it, um, something happens. And there is a clarifying. It's very mysterious. Maybe we can see something clearly. Maybe the moon reflected uh, there in that receptacle. It's said that when uh, Mugai Nyodai, that's um, Chiono's ordination name, when Mugai goes to her teacher, Mugaku, he says, he, and recites the poem, he says, Oh, take the Heart Sutra and go. And he sends her with the Heart Sutra which is just like, what love? It's like, okay, okay. You can notice. You can receive. So now, receive this. Oftentimes in these stories we get confused because sometimes they feel a little combative, you know? You think like the teacher's like, ah, oh, you're stupid, get out of here, take the Heart Sutra. Well, that actually is one side of it, right? Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, to love someone enough to be like, ah, don't be stupid, take the Heart Sutra. You know, that, that's not always said in a, um, a, a way to harm someone, right? It's also an off offering of our heart. So it's very common in, in Zen stories for them to feel a little bit rough, but, uh, but they're actually an expression of, uh, of care. Dogen Zenji, again, the founder of this school in Japan, he talks about this kind of dynamic of receiving in the Genjo Koan, one of his most famous writings. He says, conveying oneself toward all things to carry out practice enlightenment is delusion. All things coming and carrying out practice enlightenment through the self is realization. Conveying oneself toward all things to carry out this practice, to carry out this walking of the path. Like, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to go, I'm going to do it, I'm carrying myself forward to make it all happen, right? Very heroic, but he's saying, that's delusion. All things coming forward and carrying out enlightenment through the self, through the spiritual body, through the hard-to-measure being that I am, that is what we're talking about when we're talking about realization. Later on in the same, uh, in the same teaching, he says to study the Buddha way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be verified by all things. So we study the self, but we study the self to forget the self. To forget the self means that all things are coming forward and moving through here rather than I'm moving forward to experience those things. You know? It won't do any good to fill up a bucket of water and go outside and try to get the moon in it. Right? It could be fun, you know, but that's not the point. 
the moon is reflecting in the water all the time. Are you ready to receive that? One of the great good fortunes of my life, um, maybe the great good fortune of my life, is uh, meeting uh, my wife, Azusa, who is an extraordinary um, person. And um, I've known this in many ways, but one of the ways that I've known it is the way she is with children. When our children were young and we would go for a walk, you couldn't get a block in less than 10 minutes. Because she is like a total sponge of receiving a ladybug, a bird, you know, a little, she doesn't like garbage that much. <laughs> I was trying to teach her the aesthetics of garbage, it didn't work. Um, but she likes the natural things, right? And so as I watched, her, you know, my kids grow up, they grew up in this environment where things were pointed out all the time. Oh, did you receive that? Did you receive that? Did you receive that? Oh, you got the name. How beautiful this is. How wonderful this is. That's really great. It's really great. That's a kind of style of, um, of education. Right? It's a very live in a traditional Japanese way of raising children. Um, but she's she has a particular kind of knack for it. She also has these eyes. They freak me out a little bit. They, um, <laughs> she can see stuff. I just don't even know. Her, her nephew, my nephew um, too, her, her brother's son, uh, and her dad both have these same eyes. They'll like look over in the yard and they'll see like a cicada on the tree across the other side of the yard. <laughs> you know, one that's camouflaged to perfectly blend in with it. They just, they see it like that. But it comes from a life of receiving. That comes from a life of paying attention, we would say. But notice how when we say attention, we so often feel like it's me going out there to pay attention rather than I'm receiving something. The significance of the whole forest, the significance of all my life, the significance of everything that's there on the street is reflected in the step that I'm taking. Right. So Dogen uh, points us at this. You know, Genjo Kwan is one of his um, most, uh, uh, it's most popular, but it's because it's so, just so clear. And sometimes it just sounds a little bit like Zen dribbish when you read it. You're like, oh, there's no way to understand this. But if you spend time with it and you stay there with it, you start seeing like, oh, it's not complicated, actually. He's just inverting a lot of things that we take for granted, right? Like I experience the world. So if we think about Zazen, if we think about the whole of the path, as cultivating this receptivity. And this is one side of, uh, of, of what it is that uh, we work with um, as we try to receive this medicine of the Buddha Dharma. And, if you notice now how people say and when they really mean but. <laughs> <laughs> Um, or it could go either way. I actually mean and, but I mean and, which also means but. <laughs> and slash but. Uh, there's a way in which this becomes really precious. And the holding together of the bucket for the moon to shine in uh, can become our own kind of limitation. And we don't receive the fullness of the medicine or the fullness of the Dharma that is offered to us when we're trying to hold on to the body. We're trying to hold together. We're trying to measure and know the edges of that spiritual body. So while having something held together is necessary, the holding together also becomes an obstacle and there is this precious storehouse um, to which the doors won't open through efforting, won't, e won't happen through trying to make it happen. But also, if we don't care about it, if we don't do something in relationship to it, um, the doors also can't open. So that's why this question of cultivating the spiritual body. What is that? That body that can't be measured. That me that's beyond um, my grasp. 
Now back to the Genjo Koan, Dogen Zenji, after talking about conveying oneself toward all things to carry out practice enlightenment as delusion, all things coming and carrying out practice enlightenment through the self is realization. After that, he says this very mysterious thing. He says, in seeing color with the body and mind and hearing sounds with body and mind, although we perceive them intimately, it is not like reflections in a mirror or the moon in water. When one side is illuminated, the other side is dark. These dang Zen masters. <laughs> You know, the story of the moon in the bucket, or the moon in the water, is such a beautiful image. But here, Dogen's challenging us to care for this ungraspable body in a more thorough way. It is not like the reflection in a mirror or the moon in water. This intimate seeing of color with body and mind. That's an interesting thing to say too, right? Seeing color with body and mind hearing sounds with body and mind, that it's not something that is just done. You know, usually we think of seeing as just something that's happening with the eye. But he's saying the seeing is the seeing of the body, right? the seeing of the spiritual body, the hearing of the body, the hearing of the mind, that these are not like a reflection in the mirror. It's not like there's a moon and the moon is reflected inside of me that there are two things facing off each other. When one side is illuminated, the other side's dark. Moon is just moon. That's what it means to receive the moon, isn't to try to make these two sides and to be the bucket, etc. Right? But the moon reflects in me. The only way I can understand that is simply as moon. Now, you know, maybe this is why uh, Mugaku sent um, Mugai away with the Heart Sutra. Oh, of course the moon's in your bucket. Wonderful person. Here's the Heart Sutra. <laughs> Try that on. <laughs> no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. You know, we, we, we read that sutra every Sunday morning, right? It's pretty challenging. There's a lot of no's in there, right? No, 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 no. Dark mirror, dark mirror, dark mirror. One side's illuminated, the other side's dark. To study the Buddha way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be verified by all things. Right? right there, that all makes sense, right? I'm not going to carry myself forward to try to experience everything, to make everything be true. I have to step back and receive. Oh. And then everything moves through here. That actually me, the meanness, is shown through the receiving. And then Dogen goes on to say, to be verified by all things is to let the body and mind of the self and the body and mind of others drop off. So we can't just hold, hold it, right? We can just hold the moon and say, oh, see, I'm me because the moon is coming through me. Right? That's wonderful. That's an instance. That's Mugai's first poem, which is a complete instance of the way. But to come to the next realization and the next realization and to really feel the depths of the medicine, something else had to happen. And in this story, with the most famous part of the story, it does. So Mugai is fetching water, and this is known as her great um, uh, moment of awakening. She goes to fetch water, and uh, she scoops up the water, and the bottom of the bucket falls out. And bam, the whole cosmos is inverted. And all the I-ness that is consuming experience moment after moment was inverted. And she knew something in a different way. And she wrote this poem, which is translated in a lot of different ways. Um, this is one. In this way and that, I tried to save the old pail. The bamboo strips were weakening and about to break until at last the bottom fell out 
No more water in the pail. No more moon in the water. There's famous pictures of that. You can go on the internet and type in Mugai, or, and uh, you'll see these woodblock prints of her and the pail on the ground. And, you know, it's, oh, it's so dramatic. It's great. You know, a pail, like a wooden pail, most of us don't have much relationship with that anymore. Uh, some of us have a sort of relationship with metal pails, which might like rust out the bottom. Um, but most of us just only have had plastic pails. What are those five gallon buckets? Like Home Depot five gallon buckets or whatever. Um, not a lot of enlightenment coming through those because the bottoms never drop out. Um, uh, actually, if you leave them out in the sun, <laughs> they get brittle. We found that out. Um, uh, so maybe it would work then. But these older bucket, the one the bucket that Mugai would have had, is made out of wood, strips of wood. And if you think about how that bottom fits together in there, right? There's all these strips of wood, kind of like a barrel or like a hot tub if you've ever been in it. And then there's flat pieces of wood that go across the bottom and there's a, there's a, 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 like a dado cut along the bottom that all those little slats of wood fit into. And then there's bamboo, which is used like a rope, which would tie the bucket together. And then when water goes in it, all the wood swells up a little bit and the thing would, um, would hold together. Um, but, you know, things get old, right? So she'd been holding it together for a long time. She'd been holding it together for a long time, studying hard, fetching water again and again, receiving, noticing the moon. I tried to save the old pail in this way and that. The bamboo strip was weakening and about to break. Until at last, the bottom fell out. No more water in the pail. No more moon in the water. Now I offer this to you as a kind of medicine, but with a medicine there's always a poison. There's a certain kind of um, interpretation of this that leads to people becoming bucket smashers. Mm -hmm. And that's not why I give you this medicine. Some people, you know, it's why this part of the story is emphasized. Right? Ah, oh, the bottom fell out. Oh, no me. Everything. Great. Right? If I could just, because that's our fantasy, right? If I could just get rid of myself, there wouldn't be a lot of problems. <laughs> I mean, you might still be in the, if I could make everybody else be the way I went up to, there wouldn't be any problems. But that, you know, that doesn't work that well. <laughs> but then the next one's like, oh, if I could just get rid of myself, there wouldn't be any problems, you know? And that one actually doesn't work all that well either. Um, it leads to this kind of bucket smashing, this kind of understanding of Buddha Dharma as being the idea that if you could just get the bottom knocked out, that that would be what the Buddhist practice is about. I'm not, that's not the medicine that I want to give you. The Dharma that I want to present to you is that the receptivity, right, which is here in Mugai's life, the receptivity to be the receptacle of water, to be the receptacle of heart and mind in which things are reflected. That part is totally important. Dogen didn't say, don't study the self. Right? He didn't say that. He said to study the way is to study the self. But how are we going to study the self? He said to study the self is to forget the self. That forgetting of the self is not a denial of the self. It is the bringing the self forward, the receptivity of the self to receive and then engage in a different way. So we should think very deeply about Chiono's receiving, Mugai's receiving in the bu bucket and her first haiku that she presents to her teacher. Not because it's not inferior to the falling out of the bottom. But the falling out of the bottom is teaching us about what it really means to receive. It's not to hold on to these things which we receive. Because in the holding on, we immediately start to assert. We start to understand. 
we start to accomplish. And that carrying forward is where uh, we start to rebuild that calcification of my self-grasping, which deadens me, and it deadens the world. So next week, we'll have time for a couple questions, but next week I want to talk more directly about what is this practice of receptivity? What is it, what is it like you know, um, to, to intentionally engage with something that the whole point isn't to step forward, but is to step, uh, is to step back? But if there are any questions uh, today. Mm -hmm. uh, this is somewhat complicated. I believe that there's an old expression you know, about the some, that you went into some situation in the body of God. Someone asked you, how does it go? Yeah. I think, unless yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I make yeah, that yeah, up? Yeah, no, it's true. Yeah. Okay. So, so I, that's reverberating my brain. Mm -hmm. The bottom fell out. Yeah. And when I think about receptivity then and listen to you, so, so is that receptivity something like surrender? to that which we can't do anything about. So I mean, the body fell out and I can't fix it. I can't fix it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, uh, yes and no. Uh, I would say the yes part is um, uh, there, you know, most of things are out of our control. Right. And so if we go around pretending like we can control them, it's not a recipe for much harmonizing. Yeah. At the same time, if acceptance being, becomes giving up oh. on what we believe is being true, oh. then that's the bucket smashing, okay. right? So we think, we think like, oh, if I just, you know, it's just all BS, right? I'll just smash out the bottom of the bucket and let it all go through, not to judge anything at all. Uh -huh. that, that can be an understanding of this koan, which at points of time is really helpful for us because we, don't, we just need to let go and maybe a little smashing isn't that horrible. But as a standard way of approaching the world, it has so many problems. It's so self-destructive. But see, Chiono here had a different way. She, she, she cared for the water so diligently. She cared for what was reflected, which wasn't a rolling over, right? It wasn't giving up. It, she actually turned it into a poem and brought it to her teacher. Hi. Um, I'm thinking about receptivity, and I'm also thinking about the phrase "letting your guard down." Mm -hmm. And um, there's so much beauty that can happen. Like I can think of times when I was totally receptive to mm -hmm. my environment, and yeah. and then also times where um, I was hurt, you know, mm -hmm. because I wasn't. Um, and I'm just wondering what that brings yeah. up for you. Yeah. Well. I would say two things. One is um, uh, a life without hurt is, uh, you know, I, I think a, a, a very uh, stilted and um, narrow life. So, um, you know, we, of course, we don't want to be hurt and we do need to have um, um, healthy boundaries and we need to um, navigate things in a way where we're meeting them skillfully to try to minimize hurt. But, um, but hurt will be uh, central to a good life. And, I'm not, and I, don't, I don't think you're asking, like, how do I avoid hurt? But I just want to make that clear, that like, that's, that's kind of maybe the first place. And then, so if, if we accept that, or if we try to work through that, then we can say, um, my acceptance is not about letting my guard down or my receptivity is not about letting my guard down. My receptivity is about um, uh, developing a consciousness in which things are not separated from each other. That's actually the safest place to be because now I can maneuver in relationship to things with much, much more clarity. So if we think about like a, a stick, you know, a stick has a right <coughs> side and a left side. Well, just now for you, my left side was your right side, and the right side was the left side. And so we can say that, right? It was like the right side and the left side, as if they were a thing. But there's no, there's no right side or left side. 
independent of each other, right? There is only the continuity of the stick. And in the continuity of the stick, there is the possibility for a navigation that's very different than when I just like break it in half, the right's over here, the left's over here, which I'm doing with my mind all the time. So, so in this process of receptivity, it, the point again is not to smash out the bottom of the bucket and say, whatever comes, just come on all through. The point is that the receptivity of receiving allows there then to be the actualization of the continuity of this one stick. And my freedom to maneuver in relationship to things is there. My spiritual body is enhanced and my capacity to respond um, with, uh, with clarity, um, with compassion, um, is become stronger. Um, I think about, you know, when those kind of places we've been hurt, um, you know, particularly in human, um, relations kinds of hurt that, um, uh, the defense mechanism becomes, um, simply to push away. And there's something much more skillful than that, which um, isn't just to push away, it's to meet at the boundary that is true. Um, and what I mean by that is like people who are really invasive, for example, they really, you know, they kind of take, take something from you. Just pushing away might function if you can just keep them out, but then there's this big cost because you're there's all this rigidity in your being to keep them out. And you have to know where you end and they begin um, in a really rigid way to be able to do that. Another possibility is that you can say, um, like I have, there's a person in my life that's very, that's very difficult, a colleague, and I've learned to just be like, oh, I don't talk to you about those things. <clears throat> or with you about those things. I just don't. There's just a don't there. But the don't is a little different than the push away. All well, kind of other things we do talk about or we have connections with. But there is a certain place where I know it's like, oh, I can't, I can't, I can't go there. Or, or it's not healthy to go there. And so I can have a boundary in which I'm very present as opposed to just that kind of, that kind of rigidity. So this we can develop through receptivity. It's not just that if I kind of get rid of my holding that it will now, okay, I don't, I won't have to worry about it. You know, people are, will be, there'll be some problem and I'll feel okay about it. Mm -hmm. It actually means something much more, um, like, a, uh, um, invigorating and challenging. An image that just came to my head is like, okay, the bottom of the bucket's out and then the whole earth Right? Like if you look through the bottom of the bucket, now it's the whole earth. <laughs> the moon's reflection is now the whole earth. You know, and that's an enlightenment is the moon. And now there's this whole messy you know, thing. Yeah. Hi. Um, when you were talking about having someone that you just have this limit, mm -hmm. I don't we don't discuss this particular thing. If you needed to, in order to solve a problem and there was like a need beyond the two of you, mm -hmm. how do you think you would go about maybe finding a third person who could help loosen that up? Mm, yeah, yeah, and I've done that. Yeah, with this, in this particular case. Yeah, Find, okay. finding somebody who can have that communication to help us do the communication or be in, or in between or with a person, you know, and I might, and in that case, I might say, you know, this is kind of really what's real for me. I don't feel like these places that we really communicate well, or that I even really feel like I can trust you that much. And I have a sense that you can't trust me that much either in around these things. And so, um, but this thing needs to get done or this is really necessary to help other people. How could we do that? And, and you strategize about it. Now, that's a very idealized thing. It doesn't always work that way. Actually, a lot of it is just kind of like, um, we have a, a practice called forbearance. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so there is, a, there is a, a place where we just forbear it. And one of the things in that forbearance that's really important to pay attention to is it's not just, a forbearance is not just my practice, just like giving isn't something that I do out that direction, but that if I'm engaged in forbearance, 
that that doesn't mean I just take whatever someone throws at me, right? But that uh, I stay centered in my own um, uh, in my own being and continually attend to boundaries. So sometimes forbearance means like you have to walk away, or have to say no, or do something like that. But um, but oftentimes it's kind of messy. You know, you're kind of gritting your teeth, going <laughs> like that, and then you look for the place where it's like, oh no, there's something true about this. I'm not just being a punching. I'm not just you know being a punching bag or something. Because if we don't find that truth of it, it's so easy for the forbearance then to become again just a bucket crushing exercise. Mm-hmm. Like if I could just get myself out of the way, it would be fine. You know, and um, and that's not the case, actually. Our own sort of mess of muddy water and the other messes of muddy water that we um, uh, share life with. Um, we need each other. Mm-hmm. So if I don't show up, then how's anyone going to clarify it?